So, Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Lord, I ask that you just come and join our conversation this morning. That you guide us as you so see fit. That you pour out your mercy upon our heads that we might see you. Taste you, trust you, treasure you above all things and in all ways. We love you and you guide us as you so see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the time is now 9.51. Nearly 10 o'clock. If I were to tell you that today... At 4 o'clock, you were going to die. How would you spend your time? The time is now 10 o'clock. If I were to tell you that you had till 4 o'clock to live and then your life was over, you had about six hours, what would you do with it? How would you spend your time? I'll tell you what I'd do. Uh, first thing I'd do is I'd call Andy McKee, who flies a plane around, and I'd find somebody who has a parachute, and I would go skydiving because I've never done that. That'd be so fun. Then after that, I would uh, find somebody who uh, maybe has a helicopter or something like that, and I would have them drop me off with my snowboard at the top of the eagle cap, right? And I would snowboard as many of those mountains as I possibly could. Then with my remaining time, which hopefully would be a lot, I'd spend time with Jenna and the baby, right? Oh, uh, don't judge me. Uh, I'd spend time with the baby, Jenna. I'd call my friends and family, and I'd say, hey, you know, I love you. And I'd tell them, hey, I'm about to die, so if you love me, now would be a great time to tell me, right? And I'd hopefully have them speak words of comfort to me. You know, I might have a good meal. I would probably poach an elk. Uh, I'd have no problem, you know, doing that. Uh, I'm about to die. Why not? I haven't gotten elk yet. Um, I'd do all these things, and then I'd probably spend the last two hours at this time trying to figure out how I'm going to die and then avoid it, right? I'd fight it. So that's pretty much how I'd spend my time if I was going to you know, die at 4 o'clock today. How would you spend your time? What would you do? Uh, I would imagine some of us might do like a spa day, something like that. John Dundas would probably do a spa day. Um, some of us might, you know, I don't know, go fishing, spend time with our family. That's probably what we should do. Um, you'd have a good meal. You'd surround yourself with those you love and those who love you, right? If you only had a few hours to live, you'd spend time likely with those you love and those who love you. You'd spend time doing that which you love. Let me tell you what we all would likely not do. Um, high probability, you probably wouldn't go into work, right? You probably wouldn't wrap any of that stuff up. You wouldn't serve anybody. You would maybe take a me day, right? It'd be okay for it to be all about you. Uh, you probably wouldn't spend time with, um, you spend time with your good friends and your good family. You probably wouldn't spend time with your estranged, you know, Uncle Bob who you don't enjoy spending time with. Like, you wouldn't waste your time, right? You wouldn't spend time with your flaky friends or even your enemies. You would dial in to those who love you and those who love uh, doing that which you love, right? Uh, I would imagine most of us would spend our time doing something just like that. Here's why we bring this up. In today's text, we jump into the upper room discourse, which means in a couple hours, let's say six hours, uh, Jesus is going to be arrested, he's going to be falsely accused, falsely tried, and then tortured, and then crucified. So he has, in our dialogue tonight, today, uh, this night, he has about six hours left to live. How does he spend his time? What does he end up doing? What does Jesus do with the last few hours that he has remaining here on this earth before he is crucified? Well, in order to answer that question, we've got to read today's text. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in John 13, starting in verse 1, going to verse 20. We'll be alluding heavily to what's going on in verses 20 through 30. But for now, we'll read these 20 verses to answer the question, what is Jesus doing with the last few hours of his life? The answer, found chapter 13. Take a look. Verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. 
Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. When he washed their feet and put on his outer garment and was in his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and right you are, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I sent receives me, and whoever receives me, the one who sent me. So our question as we jump in this text is, Jesus has a few hours left to live. How does he spend his time? Most of us would spend it doing the things that we love to do with those we love to do it with. Uh, we would, we would make have a, a me day. And then in our final few hours, we might actually fight for our lives, try and figure out how we're going to die and try and avoid it, right? But what is Jesus doing? The God of the universe, who can be anywhere at any time doing anything he wants, he can elude death, he can get out of this whole situation. What does he do? He gathers up his disciples. He strips off his clothes. He wraps a towel about himself. He gets down on the ground and starts washing their feet. Now, in just a few hours, um, one of them is going to deny him. The other has already betrayed him, and all of these guys are going to abandon him. I don't know about you, but I think you could probably put category, uh, the, the, the disciples in the category of flaky friends or enemies. At the end of the day, they're going to abandon him, and yet that's who Jesus decides to spend his time with. Not just hanging out. Jesus isn't hanging out with them and saying, hey guys, can, I'm about to die and all this stuff is about to happen. Can you speak words of comfort to me? No, what is he doing? He's speaking words of comfort to them. He's about to die. He is literally about to go through hell itself. And he is on the ground serving them, washing their feet, loving them well, and speaking words of comfort to them. He's not fighting for his life like we all would do. Rather, he's fighting for his friends there on the ground. If you were with us a couple of weeks ago, you'll recall we talked about um, what it is to wash somebody's feet in this culture and society. And we talked about how that was the lowliest position you could have in this, as a servant, was to wash somebody's feet because it was just seen as that degrading, that diminishing, um, that low of a position. We talked about how some places in the Roman Empire, it was literally illegal to force your servant to do this because it was just that degrading of a position. And you know, what do you see? The God of the universe, the master of all things, strips himself down, wraps a towel about his waist, gets on the floor and assumes the position of the lowest possible servant to serve, wash, and clean the feet, the feet of his disciples who are about to use those clean feet to run away from him. This is mind-blowing. This is crazy. This is unbelievable. This is how Jesus chooses to spend the last few hours of his life, on the ground, serving his disciples. If you've been with us all throughout the Gospel of John, it's been basically answering one question, which is, who is this Jesus guy? What does it mean for him to be king? What does it mean for him to be Messiah? Uh, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth? The answer is, he's the God of the universe who gets on his knees to wash the dirty feet of his flaky friends and enemies who are about to bail him. That's the picture you're supposed to see. Jesus Christ, on the ground, half naked, wrapped in a towel, vulnerable and exposed before his friends, washing their feet moments before he's about to be killed. Absolutely good. But the text actually doesn't stop there. After Jesus uh, washes the disciples' feet, he does something pretty remarkable. He gets up and he asks them the question. He says, 
Do you understand what I've done to you and what I've done for you? He says, you call me Lord and teacher, and right you are, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, how much more so should you wash one another's feet? This is an example that I've given to you, that you might love and serve one another. Now, I don't know about you, but as soon as Jesus starts talking about loving and serving, um, in my mind, when I first read it, I started to check out just a little bit. Because I already knew this part, right? I know that Jesus calls us to love and serve one another, and so yeah, now he goes into a big discourse about loving and serving. But then he says one thing that caught my eye and made me take two steps back. He says this, he says, if you know these things, and everybody knows that Jesus calls us to love and serve one another, right? Does anybody not know that? We all know Jesus Christ came down, he loved and served us, and now calls us to do the same. We all know that, right? But Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do these things. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do these things. Now, that changes things for us. And I'll tell you how by first sharing with you a story and then sharing with you, hopefully, the principles from that story. Um, all right. On the front end, I have to ask for no judgment, okay? No judgment, can't judge me, and I'm not endorsing anything I'm about to say to you, okay? Is that fair? All right. Disclaimer aside. Okay. So, a couple years ago, Volkswagen of America lied to the uh, American people and to the American government. They said that their diesel engines uh, produced this many bad emissions, but in reality, uh, their Volkswagens were producing this amount of bad emissions, right? If you guys ever, it's sometimes called diesel gate. Volkswagen lied to the American public, the American government, about their poor emissions and the U.S. government found out about it. They got really mad at Volkswagen, and so they sued them, and so what Volkswagen had to do is they had to recall all of their vehicles, and they had to reimburse their owners um, almost the full amount, like with little depreciation. Well, what did that mean for Jenna and I? Uh, by the grace of God, we had one of these bad emitting Volkswagen diesel cars, and so after having this car for five years, they contacted us and said, hey, we're basically going to buy it back from you at the price you paid for. So, on December 27th, 2018, the last day we could turn this car in, Volkswagen said, if you bring your car to our dealership and all that stuff, we're going to write you a fat check for $23,000 if you just bring the car in. Now, I'd done my research, and I knew that uh, the cars that they were going to recall we're literally just going to go sit in a lot somewhere in Colorado because they can't be used. Uh, it just it makes more sense for them to be in a lot. So I knew that this car was just going to go and sit somewhere. And all my life, I've been looking for an opportunity to take a car out and either pull like a Jason Bourne or a James Bond or like an Italian job, Grand Theft Auto. I just wanted to go and tear a car up. You know what I'm saying? Like, just have fun. Like what you want to do with your rental car that you're too scared to do, that's what I wanted to do with the car. And I wasn't alone in this. I'd always talk to my younger brother about, hey, if we ever get a car, we're gonna go and just tear this thing up to be awesome. You know, burnouts, donuts, figure eights, you know, just Jason Bourne style. You guys know what I'm talking about? And by the grace of God, my brother was in town every weekend. And not only my brother was in town, but my best friend was in town, and my other best friend was and so I literally called up all these boys. I said, listen, boys, I've got an offer. You can't do this. I said, have you ever wanted a Jason Bourne, you know, James Bond, Italian job, a car? Because if so, I've got a free car that we can do that in. That literally is about to go sit in the lot. It's a perfectly working car. It's going to go sit in the lot. And the only thing we have to do is we have to make sure that this thing is safe and sound at the dealership at 5.30 today. R-U-M. And it was like... I mean, I made their lives. I mean, they love absolutely. Amazing. So 145, we're going to circle up. Now I had one obstacle, which was a beautiful obstacle. That was my wife. Okay. <laughs> so I go to Jen. I think I went on my knees. I think I literally went on my knees. I said, "Babe, I love you." Um, and you know, my heart has always been to go out and just enjoy riding a car, just you know, have fun with it. And here's an opportunity. Can I do it? And her response was, no. And I was like, okay. You know, and I laid out all my reasons. And she never really said yes, but you know when the no's get really, really softer and softer and softer? It's like, no. And it's like, oh, we're making progress. And then she was like, 
no. And I was like, yes, we're there. You know what I mean? So like, she eventually kind of said yes. Okay? But I was like, babe, I promise, uh, that, uh, this is, I love my wife. I said, babe, I promise I'm not gonna hurt the car or something. And she said, I'm not worried about the car, I'm worried about you. Isn't that amazing? Oh, I love that. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, who cares about me? I won't hurt the car. So um, before I left the house that day, I prayed three times, twice out loud with Jenna, and, uh, and I was basically asking the Lord to grant me favor and glory in this excursion. And when I pray, and I'd encourage you to do this, um, so here's what prayer is to me. Prayer is me offering up my thoughts to God. His word is offering his thoughts in return. So when I pray, I literally make my request known to the Lord, and then I sift through my mind all the scripture that I know, and he literally sometimes popping up the book and just looking through stuff to say, okay, God, what's your response back to me? And when I pray, which I think my prayer was something like, Lord, will you bless this excursion for me to go out and have a blast with my friends? Um, two passages of scripture came to mind. Uh, the first was from, both of from the Proverbs. First one is this, it says, um, uh, B, it effectively says, take good care of the resources that I've given you, you know? I.e., don't go joyride, dude, is pretty much what happened. Just take the check, drive the car on in, don't be an idiot, take the check, take good care of the resources. It's talking literally about sheep and flocks and taking care of your herds and being a good steward. And so that was the first thing that came to mind is, okay, I should be a good steward of these resources. And the second passage that came to mind is it's from the Proverbs. It says, if you ignore wisdom, wisdom will laugh at you in the day of calamity. And I was thinking, well, if wisdom laughs at me, I'll just laugh with it. It'll be a great moment where we're all laughing. I'm an idiot, okay? Don't judge me. So I'm, I'm leaving the house. I've gotten kind of Jenna's blessing. And I realize as I leave the house that I'm taking a $23,000 risk by going out joyriding with my friends. And if something were to happen to the car or to us, that that would be on me because I had fair warning from the Lord maybe not to go and pursue such an endeavor. Basically, if we get in a wreck, I can't come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your mercy. You know, why'd you do this? All that stuff. He's like, you, I've spoken to you through my word. Take good care of your resources. If you choose to go out there, just know that you're going to potentially have a $23,000 joy ride. So I was like, I'm aware of that. Thank you, Lord. And I head on out to the house. Show up with the boards, right? And we had an absolute blast. I mean, we were, everything was safe and mostly legal. Uh, we were on, you know, we weren't near any other cars or houses or anything like that, some abandoned roads. And I mean, we were burning now, we were doing donuts, we were doing figure eights, we were doing time trials. My favorite thing is we were driving as fast as we could, and they would cut the wheel, pull the e-brake, and just spin, and oh, it was a blast. Now, at some point, we thought maybe the cops were called or uh, security was coming, so what did we do? We just changed locations, and uh, we come to this beautiful, like half mile circuit where they're building new houses, but um, there's only one that's halfway built and everything else is abandoned. It's just this beautiful residential road. So we think, all right, now it's time for the Fast and the Furious. We're going to see who can take this little half mile circuit the fastest. So my buddy, Mac Gonzalez, gets in the chair. Now each time one of them got in the chair, I literally had them say to me, $23,000 because I wanted them to remember that that's what was writing. It's like, we can do anything, but we can't wreck this car, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah no problem, no problem. Mac is all, gets my time. We start the timer, Mark, get set, go. He peels out, he's heading down this stretch, he comes to the first turn, we're probably going about 35 miles an hour. I'm not endorsing this for all the parents out there who are worried about the kids doing this. We're heading into the first turn, and he cuts the wheel, pulls the e-brake, we slide into this with the We're all screaming like girls. We're having a great time. Pulls out, and now we're heading into the second uh, turn, which is more of an elbow kind of turn. He's hitting it probably 40, 45 miles an hour, pulls the e-brake, cuts the wheel. Oh, it's just, ah, God, it's out. It's so fun. We come to the third, and what would be the final turn for us. And Gonzo, my good buddy, is not slowing down. And I keep thinking in my mind, oh, he's gonna slow down. We're good, he's gonna slow down, you know? But then you just keep getting closer and closer to the turn. Eventually, we're heading to this turn. He's probably going, trying not to exaggerate. He's at least 50 to 55. I wanna say more, but I'm trying to be conservative. He's flying into this turn, and he cuts it. This is just a thin little residential 90 degree turn. He cuts it, last minute, we hit some water. We go 
careening through the turn, over the curb, through a construction fence. We hit two sewer pipes, and we land in a ditch, and the car just goes boom, and the front end just crunches on the front end. And I'm thinking, oh my lanta. I have just blown $23,000. I am a fool. Um, I also had this thought as bad one. I was like, this is a $23,000 sermon illustration, is what this is right here. <laughs> but me being born. But we crunch, we get out of the car, the front of the car is in like a trench ditch thing. It's all folded up underneath itself. And uh, one of the wheels, all I remember was one of the wheels is off the ground, and it's just spinning like this. The engine's cut off, there's smoke, everything like that. And I'm thinking, oh my land, I am a fool. Because of the two things circling in my mind of these problems, which is take care of the resources that I give you. And if you ignore wisdom, wisdom will laugh at you. And I'll just tell you this, I was not laughing with calamity that day. Um, and then this hit me. Oh, the, re the way this is all connected, literally the first time I taught on this passage was the week before, the, the week after this thing happened. So this passage was literally on my ah! I get out, and this passage then comes to mind. And it's Jesus saying, um, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do these things. There is a very important biblical principle here in this text and illustrating this story that's this. According to Scripture, if you know something, but don't apply what you know, Scripture would say to you, you do not know it. If I claim to know what Scripture says, but I don't act on it, Scripture says you do not know it. So that day, I knew what Scripture said, which was, Dave, this is not a good idea, this is not a wise decision, but I chose not to act on it, and so Scripture would say, you did not know it at all. In Scripture, to know something and not do something is to not know it at all. If we are here this morning and all of us know that we ought to love and serve one another as Christ has loved and served us, if we know that but we don't do that, Scripture would say to us, you do not know it at all. And according to this text, it would say, the blessing is not in the knowledge. The blessing is in the doing. You're not blessed to know that you ought to love and serve. You're only blessed when you actually love and serve. That's what this text calls us to do. Now, more on the Jeddah story in a minute, but when it comes to this text right here, um, I immediately have like several things that pop up in my mind on why I don't love and serve. I know that I should and I want to be blessed, so how do I pursue it? Well, first got to get over a few obstacles that come to mind. The first would be the typical excuse that surfaces in my mind of when I feel convicted or called to love and serve is this. I don't have any time. Um, with what time will I love to serve? Got family, got job, got all these different things. Lord, I don't have any time. The second thing that comes to mind for me is, Lord, uh, sometimes loving and serving takes resources, and I don't have resources, you know, just uh, frivolous extra resources to pour out. So uh, I don't have the time, I don't have the resources, Lord, I don't have the opportunity. And really, if I'm being honest, at the end of the day, one of the reasons I don't serve is because I don't have the motivation. Uh, it's just hard to engage. So what might this passage speak in those four objections to actually loving and serving? The first is this. We say we don't have time. The one thing I want to draw your attention to is if ever there were anyone anywhere who did not have time to get down on his hands and knees and wash somebody's feet, it would be Jesus Christ right here in this passage. He is literally the most important person to walk the face of the earth ever. This guy had a busy schedule. This guy was about to die. He has six hours of free time. And what does he do? He makes the time to get down on the ground to serve his flaky friends and enemy. When I say to the Lord, I don't have time, he reminds me of this passage saying, how much time did my son have here? Just a few hours, and look how he spent. Um, we don't have time. It's just an excuse. What the scripture calls to do is make time. Make time that you might be blessed as you serve others. The second thing I think of is, well, Lord, I don't have resources. I think this is so cool in the text. Um, Jesus could have done anything to serve these guys. He could have snapped his finger. It could have been like banquet feast right there. He could have taken them snowboarding up some Jewish mountain, right? It would be awesome, shred the gnar. But he could have done a thousand things for them. But what does he do? He doesn't, he 
doesn't, Jesus has unlimited resources, but look at the resources he draws upon to serve his life. He strips himself of resources. He literally wraps himself in a towel and gets down on the ground, demonstrating to us that you don't have to have resources to serve, you just have to have a heart to serve. And the Lord will provide resources as he so sees fit to match your heart center. The other thing I think is I think, well, I don't have an opportunity to serve, uh, Lord, so I just don't see anything. One thing consistently throughout the Gospels is Jesus often tells his disciples, he says, lift up your eyes and see that the harvest is white for harvesting. Uh, consistently throughout the text, we're seeing Jesus literally tell his disciples, lift up your eyes. He's saying, hey, just look around you. Ask the Lord to open up your eyes to see moments to serve in it. Put the ball in God's court, saying, Lord, if you want me to serve, provide opportunities. Open up my eyes to see if when he provides them, jump into it. Uh, we say we don't have opportunities to serve. Look what Jesus does. He creates an opportunity to serve. And the last objection I have to serving is typically this one. Lord, I'm lacking the motivation to do so. Um, it's just sometimes hard to motivate myself. So where am I going to find the motivation to go and love and serve others? And that's where we get back to the Jeff story. So I get out of the car. Um, and immediately we landed in the mud. And because this text was on my mind, as soon as we all got out of the car, our feet were dirty. Just, it was just very strange and bizarre. We had dirty feet, we look at the car, crumpled underneath itself, tires spinning, smoke is flaring. And I was thinking, okay, um, I deserve this. And I am going to pray, but I, I know the Lord has no obligation to me at all. And it's, Lord, I, I literally have dirty feet. I made a huge mistake. Jenna is literally going to kill me. Um, and so, Lord, I lay the situation at your feet, saying, I have dirty feet. Can you help? Call a tow truck. Can't show up. We are I think we had an hour to get the car to the dealership, if it were to happen. There's no chance it's there. All of a sudden, some construction guys drive by. They've got a tow strap. They grab the back of the Jetta, and they just yank it out of the mud. And I'm thinking, well, we got it out of the mud. That's awesome. But I don't know if this thing's going to start. We hop in the car, and we turn it on. Car turns on. Now I'm not getting my hopes up yet. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I still have dirty feet. I've made a huge mistake. I'm completely undeserved. But can we get this thing down the road? Uh, we get some industrial strength and zip ties. We literally just zip tie this entire car together. I mean, it's literally like the engine is falling out. We're just going to zip tie it up in there. And uh, by the grace of God, it shifts in the drive. We start driving down the road, and all four of us sit in the car like this. Because the axles are like all funny. We're just driving on the road like this. One. And it's covered in mud. I can't get into the dealership like that. And so we pull over to the car wash. And uh, this is the funniest part of the story. We pull into this car wash, right? And it has these different levels in which you can purchase a package. It's got like bronze and silver and gold and platinum and diamond, right? And I pull up to the window, and my buddy Matt, who wrecked the car, is like, don't worry, bro. I got this. <laughs> and he hands me his card. And I, somehow he had to ask the attendant, so I'm about to choose the option. And he literally asked the attendant, what's the price difference between the bronze level and the silver level? I'm like, I am going to kill you right now. You just cost me $23,000 and you want to know the difference between bronze and silver at the local car wash. You know? oh, he's going to come up here sometime. You guys give him a hard time. So we pull into the thing, and the attendants are worried that literally if the car wash starts hitting it, the car is just going to fall apart. I'm like, don't worry about it. We'll fix it later. We've got plenty of zip ties, right? And so we go through the thing, and the car comes out, you know, limping out of the car wash. It's cleanish. And so I call Jenna. I'm like, hey, babe. We have 30 minutes to get to the dealership. I'm like, hey, babe. Um, meet me at the dealership. Why? I thought we were going to be here. Um, we had a bit of an accident. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I can't hear. I gotta go. You know, I nearly got shot for that one. But we pull up, I pull up the dealership, right? Joe meets me there. And the attendant comes out and he says this. I can't believe he missed it. And this is by the grace of God. I turn off the car. I don't know. I don't anticipate it's going to start again. I turn off the car. We go inside and talk to the guy. The guy says, okay, here's how it works. Um, I've got to take a video of you starting the car. Backing the car up five feet and pulling forward five feet. If it does all those things, I'll write you a check for twenty-three thousand dollars. The guy has not seen our car yet, right? And I'm like, oh Lord, please, God, please. 
I'm texting my buddies, I'm like, you guys are all praying, man, you better be praying right now. I'm like, Lord, we are so close. We walk out the parking lot, the guy literally pulls out his video camera, then hops in the car, and it's like, kick, 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 and it turns out, I'm like, oh! She puts it in reverse, and like, kick, 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 puts it in reverse, and like, slowly backs the thing up five feet, puts it forward, pulls it together five feet, the guy hits stop on his video, Recorder says, good enough for me, writes us a check for $23,000 right there on the spot. And I nearly fell down, fainted, in gratitude and in grace. Um, the first time I ever taught on this passage uh, was one week after this episode. And by the time I showed up to the dealership, my feet were still dirty. This passage was just circling around in my mind. And I think what I learned was this. I was completely undeserving of God's grace there in that moment. Completely undeserving. I had superseded, I wouldn't say it was necessarily I had superseded his command, but I had superseded his wisdom and instruction and encouragement, if you will. And I was there with my dirty feet and my poor mistakes. And what did God do through that moment? Um, he got down on the ground. He washed my feet, forgave my mistakes. And I watched him serve me through that episode as he poured out his grace upon me. And after that episode, after that experience with this text on my mind, that's when I found the motivation to serve and love other people. Because I first saw my master do it for me. He got down on the ground and washed my feet. He just didn't do it for me in this one circumstantial moment, but he actually does it for Peter here in this story. He's literally trying to get on the ground with Peter, and Peter is arguing with him, saying, you can't wash my feet. It's just nothing but Peter's pride. He's like, no, Lord, you can't do this. And Jesus is saying, Peter, just trust me. Peter, just humble yourself. Peter, just let me wash your feet. And, and later in this episode, we're going to see that Peter's going to say to the Lord, I will never deny you. I'll die for you. And Jesus says, die for me, Peter. By the end of the morning, you're going to deny me three times. He's getting on the ground, washing this man's feet, who's about to deny him in front of everybody. He gets down on the ground and washes Judas Iscariot's feet. Literally, he washes his feet before Judas goes out to betray him. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but uh, Jesus quotes, or John quotes the passage from Psalms, which says, He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. The ironic part of that entire thing is that it wasn't the first time, the first time that Judas lifted his heel against Jesus in this text was not when he betrayed him. It was actually Jesus lifting his feet off the ground to wash it. I mean, completely undeserving. The God of the universe on the ground washing the feet of his disciples who are about to abandon him, one's going to deny him, and one is on his way to betray him. They're completely undeserving, and yet there he is, gladly washing their feet. You will never be able to serve those around you and love them well until you first see the God of the universe on the ground, serving and loving Today's passage has two main points for us. The first um, is this, that the Lord loves and serves as well. Completely undeserved. It's just by His grace and goodness of God. And the other thing He does is when we see what He's done on our behalf, it melts our heart and it makes us want to get on the floor with Him and serve right alongside Him. When I see what he's done for me, it makes me want to join him in doing what he's done for me for others. That's what this text is all about. Christ first loved and served us, and now he calls us to love and serve. Just a moment, the band is going to come on up. And we're going to take um, a time for worship, but we're also going to take a time for uh, communion. Um, there are two sacraments that the Lord has given us. One is baptism, and one is communion. What we mean by sacraments are these are two specific things that the Lord gave us to do. Baptism, as you guys know, is a witness to the outside world that we've been cleansed by God and the Holy Spirit. It is a one-time outward expression of an inward reality that we are in right fellowship with Christ, namely He's washed us clean. Communion, however, is a reoccurring event where we uh, partake of the elements as a remembrance of who Christ is and what he's done, but also it's a testimony to the fact that he cleanses us regularly. If I could adopt today's text 
He tells Peter this, he says to Peter, um, those who have been bathed do not need to wash again because they've already been cleansed and they've already been cleaned. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've already been cleansed, you've already been washed clean by the Holy Spirit. However, we make mistakes on a regular basis. So what this text is teaching us is that our feet still get dirty. Communion is a time for us to recognize that God has cleansed all of us, and yet we still come to him with our um, our sins and our, and our things we've done since that time. We say, Lord, would you wash my feet? And what we see is, he said, blessed are those who um, do these things. He's saying, happy are those who do this. So you know what that means? That means when God was on the ground washing the disciples' feet, he was not doing so begrudgingly. He was doing so joyfully. So as we come at a time of communion, effectively what we're saying to the Lord is we're saying, Lord, would you wash my feet? And he says, glad. He says, uh, take these things in my remembrance. The juice representing my blood, bread representing my body, all poured out for you. Uh, I've cleansed you once, and now I cleanse you uh, continually. I wash your feet. And what we're going to do for the next time of worship is we're going to remember just that. A time where you can wash my feet. So I'm going to pray for us. The band's going to come on up. And during this next song, we encourage you uh, to take the elements if you're a believer um, and remember it's who he is and what he's done. In fact, he not only cleanses us, but he washes us. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you and praise you for our good and gracious Lord to us all the time. Uh, Lord, a uh, stupid car story is one of a thousand times um, where I've blown it. One of a billion times where I've blown it. Big, Lord. And yet, in that one story for me, Lord, is just a reminder of your goodness, your kindness, and your grace, though I was completely undeserved. Uh, Lord, um, I ask that you come now and join us in this time. Lord, for those of us who are believers, I ask that you remind us that because of what you did on the cross, we are clean. And because now of what you do on the cross, you also clean our feet. We bring to you our dirty feet, our mistakes, our sins, and we ask that you um, continue to wash us and allow us to see that you do it kind of joyfully. We love you. Come and guide us as you so see fit for us. Your mercy upon our hands. Jesus, we pray. Amen. During this next song, take up the elements as you like. And then uh, if you want,